Okay, we are currently live. Hello and welcome to Off the Wall Novels in a collaboration video with Everyone Who Reads It Must Converse. I am Daniel Backer and I'm joined by Noah Clemens. How's it going? Pretty good, bud. How are you? Doing great. Cool. Thanks for uh, thanks for uh, getting me on over here. Uh, I love this short story collection. It was really cool to see you uh, doing another pioneer. And then uh, I, I just said, uh, if if there's some something we can collaborate on right off the rip, it is <laughs> oblivion, right? That's that's exactly right. Because I enjoyed your video as well on uh, good old neon. So it seemed only natural that we we team up for the titular story in the collection. So uh, if, if you want to uh, kind of introduce what we're going to do here today, I'll give you the floor. Cool. Well, uh, Oblivion is this, you know, like you said, you know, it's the, it's the name of the collection. There, there's a reason for that. There is, there is a lot of power in this story. It is something that um, on the first read is just a mind blow. <laughs> and you're wondering what, what David Foster Wallace is doing and what he does is always unexpected and always just a just a masterful thing, right? I would say that this is probably the scariest story in the in the whole collection. Just this fear, dread, um, you know, uh, insanity, madness. That kind of uh, feeling is pervasive. We we watch a character go through it, but there's a, there's there's something to be said about this uh, this story as far as uh, it being triggering. There is there is an underlying subtext of abuse, and we'll get to that. That's right. And if I can interject here for a moment, um, I hadn't thought of this on our phone call preparing for this the other day, but um, David Foster Wallace outlined some of his thoughts in the essay that he wrote on David Lynch which is in the collection, um, oh, oh, I, I, the name is completely escaping, with the, with the cruise ship, the- uh, Yeah, the uh, fun supposedly thing. fun thing I'll never do again. There you go. <laughs> so um, on the essay on David Lynch in that collection, one of the pieces of insight that he gives about David Lynch's films is that it's not always something that's big and in your face that's terrifying. It's everything presented as being very normal and then one thing that protrudes that doesn't stick or that doesn't uh, fit in with everything else that makes it horrifying. And I think that that is completely channeled into this short story because the impression that you get when you start it and when you're reading it for the first time ends up being very, very different from what you end up taking from this story on subsequent reads and on paying attention to the tiny little details. And so we're gonna get into all of that today in this video. Definitely. In, 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 uh you know, true to true to form for David Foster Wallace, there is an overwhelming amount of detail, yes. <laughs> overwhelming amount of this hyper uh, realism where you're just like, why is all this happening? And I, I will say, okay, so uh, we can just, we can just get started on it then. Let's do it. Yeah, <laughs> our, let's our main in. character is Randall Napier and we meet him and he's uh, at, at, a, at a little clubhouse on a golf course with his stepfather and they have or, or been his, ranked his out wife's stepfather right his wife's stepfather yeah. but also his his as his in-law that's his right. that's wife's right. it's his in-law but it's his wife's stepfather too mm -hmm. as well and um they've been rained out it's raining there's a thunderstorm outside or something so they just went to the clubhouse they're having a bite or something like this and that's our opening and he does a very human normal thing and he starts talking about his marital issues <laughs> yep and uh i i think it's fair to say that kind of like i'd mentioned a lot of it sort of proceeds like you would expect in this kind of familiar setup of the the son-in-law with the father-in-law and the father-in-law is very dismissive and right. he seems to i think he's described at one point as like he he sees that his father-in-law looks at him like a fly that's like intruded into the room. And the fact that he even voices this these concerns in front of him just shows that he's incompetent and, right. and terrible, right? Well, and why would you, you know, you, if you're going to uh, kind of complain about your spouse, 
you don't want to do that to her parents. Right. You know what I mean? It's not, <laughs> not, a, not a good look, but it is a guy's day. They're golfing, you know, so, so you can kind of, you give it that this is a story and, and it, and it goes on and it is, there's, there's digressions all through it. There's, there's this kind of thing where, like you said, not Sipe, Dr. Sipe is the, is the dad there. He um, doesn't care what, what Randall's talking about. He doesn't have anything to say. He's not, he's not helpful and he's not even acknowledging, but as a reader, we get a portrait. We get, we get this picture painted for us of Randall and his wife, Hope, their daughter, Audrey is of age to move out. So they're kind of in the empty nest stage of life or approaching they can see it approaching and there is something that may, may be uh you know benign something that is a small problem but it has become um horribly what is the word? like just <laughs> has so much energy has so much behind it that um they're they're their relationship is like falling apart from it and what it is is that he snores he, well he's accused of snoring that's right hope is waking up night after night and has been doing this for seven months it says at the beginning of this story when he's saying this um and 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 wakes him up out of sleep and accuses him of snoring and she can't sleep and it's just every night over and over and he is convinced that at least most of the time he's 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 done this where he's not even asleep he's okay. awake and she wakes up out of a dead sleep hits him and is like stop snoring you know i can't i can't i can't do this i can't you have to go sleep in audrey's room uh so he'll go he'll go sleep in you know the the daughter's um the daughter's bed and and also to say just to point out right at the beginning that audrey is not his blood daughter that's right. hope hope is uh audrey's mother and audrey is a um you know step uh daughter right and and to to just push that a little bit further i'd say it's like a pretty dominant theme among the different relationships that are explored in this story that a lot of them are not either their first spouse when talking about um, Dr. Sipe, for example, his new wife is described as the latest Mrs. Sipe. So right. that there have been like <laughs> others. And, and so I think that like within the sort of familiar marital problem of somebody snoring and keeping their spouse awake, the way that they introduce some of these deeper themes is that like a lot of the characters um, have already tenuous connections before these things start and that there is like a little bit of maybe distrust and a feeling of disconnection before the the story even starts right yeah definitely um and we don't get much anything of audrey except for from randall in kind of flashbacks or him uh you know his memories or something like this randall is is pretty much the only uh character that we really have a grasp on and even that is uh tenuous so <laughs> he's basically denying the fact that he snores uh it is it is this kind of thing where he is consumed by this as well because there's fights there's arguments and he's at least willing at in in some ways to concede that at least he says this, he's willing to concede that he might be snoring. He might be, uh, you know, it, it might be what, what uh, Hope is saying that it is, but he doesn't think so. And she is very uh, staunch on her, on her uh, claim and will, not, and will not concede anything. So he starts going to a, a counselor, couples counselor, but alone, <laughs> which is a uh, another source of uh you know just makes his life is it's like a descent into madness he's he's just getting consumed 
by this. But when that came through, I wanted to show. Please. Yeah. Okay. He, he goes to the couple's counselor and that's when he has the problem with her just ask just asking questions well how can you really know when you're asleep or when you're awake that kind of thing and he's like well i mean i know when i'm asleep or when i'm awake right i'm 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 keeping an eye on this this has been going on for months you know so i'm telling you that i know when i'm asleep and i'm awake and she's like yeah well you know but you can't really know if you're asleep or you're awake because you just fall out of consciousness you know and it's just a constant the claims cannot be verified or denied definitively there is no answer for this kind of thing so he goes to an ear nose and throat specialist and has a checkout check check up look at the soft palate everything make sure there's nothing out of order would he be snoring or not that kind of thing he does it without hopes knowledge you know he's 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 consumed and um, it's very effectively done. You're just, I mean, when I was reading this thing, I'm just like, you know, in it, like, because this guy's going nuts. But uh, this part right here, he says, I later, and when I put the, this is single inverted commas. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see if this makes sense to you. I later, however, made the mistake of throwing this clean bill of health up in hopes face during one of the increasingly heated and upsetting arguments these often occurring over the following morning's breakfast respecting the so-called snoring issue whereupon hope seized on my failure to have told her about the ear ear nose and throat referral as evidence that i knew the snoring was real and that secretly concerned about it that i had been unwilling to tell her about the appointment in advance for fear that she that the specialist diagnosis would identify something amiss in my soft palate or nasal passages and that I would have to admit openly to her that the snoring was real and that all of my accusations that she was sleep asleep and simply dreaming that I was snoring had been merely so much self-serving denial and projection of the problem on the victim of it, referring, of course, to herself. <laughs> the the single inverted commas make no sense. Like, why are they even there? You're not calling attention to something. You're not calling attention that something is not exactly what you're saying. A lot of that stuff, you know, throw it up in Hope's face. What? Why? So there's this punctuation and the ways that things are worded in this. You 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 become really enwrapped in that kind of this is he's he's losing it he's losing it with that you know well and i i think one of the things that makes that so powerful is that <coughs> is one of those kind of like wallace like characters that's so neurotic and so well spoken and since it's told in first person too you really get everything from this guy's perspective and then through that, even though he's the one that's telling you the story and it's framed in that way, we still are getting the sense of like dramatic irony here, that it's like there is something even within his hyper awareness and, and really intellectual perspective that he is not aware of that's sort of like rising off of the top of the things that he's saying where, where we're distrusting him. And, and that's furthered by, by one of the things that makes us start to question, like, does he have a good grasp on his consciousness? that he's hallucinating constantly. He's hallucinating and story. knows that he's hallucinating, says that or he knows, he knows it, you know? <laughs> yeah, he calls it out. And then he staunchly claims that he knows when he's hallucinating and when he's not hallucinating. Mm -hmm. And there's example after example in the text of that kind of hallucination. Like, it's just crazy. I mean, it's scary and crazy for sure. Because he, I remember that like he describes when he's in the 19th hole at the golf club, he's looking at pictures and he's seeing them like rotate and spin in his vision. And he, he frequently normalizes his perception by holding one hand over one eye and then the other <laughs> eye, and that, which is just this really weird self-soothing self -soothing thing. 
that hey, teaches he has like, this yeah, technique. I have a grasp. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. It's fine, yeah. guys. Yeah. I, I know that I'm hallucinating because I have a technique to test myself, right? Exactly. So I mean it's it's ridiculous. <laughs> and it's that kind of thing where a crazy person is never gonna say, Yeah, I'm completely crazy. Mm-hmm. I, you know, a crazy person, a real crazy person, uh, you know, thinks that they, that there's plausible reason for everything, for what they think might be a French thinker. They might be different than everybody else as well. And that kind of thing, but they're not completely crazy and off the hinges because there is valid reason for it and all that kind of thing. And he is justifying his, what we can see as a reader as completely complete insanity over uh this issue and it's not just the issue i mean he's becoming completely sleep deprived and has been doing that for months and and it's just gotten to a head by the time it gets to the point where he approaches hope and uh makes the appointment for the sleep study as a reader you're just like yes okay okay. let's get to the bottom of this please god you know you're like with him in that that like please let's have some answers we you know this thing can this thing is too complex everybody has their own kind of uh subjective ideas randall hope whoever um and 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 there's just no way to confirm or deny it unless you have a, a third party full on sleep study. So they do that sleep study that is every Wednesday for like six weeks or seven weeks, right? That's right. And they have to like re- recreate the conditions of their of their nighttime routines and they hook them up to the like e- or uh, EEG yeah. nodes on their heads or something yeah. like that. And they're reading their their things before they settle down and everything and they're being recorded all night all that kind of stuff it's very i mean and it's uh, of course another uh just like this whole story and, and all of david foster wallace done very well and to an exhaustive extent of de- describing um the situation that they're in and you know they're 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 in a laboratory they're in a sleep laboratory and it's not and it's not fun Yet he is, he has this kind of self-righteousness the whole time because he is doing this and he wants, he wants the truth no matter what it might be. And then, um, drives back and, and, and goes to a full day of work the next day, you know, and, and it's just driving home that this guy, even though he, he has all these mechanisms, coping mechanisms, he's at the end of his rope. And you feel like something is about to happen and, and you don't know what is about to happen. That's for sure. <laughs> See, and again, that's why like he, he pulls off David Foster Wallace that is like such this, this like excellent contrast here, because like at the end of the day, it, this does seem kind of like a trivial issue, you know, it's like, and then I, I know that like alternate interpretations are given within the text of being like, well, is like, isn't it possible that this is just empty nest syndrome and that you right. guys are projecting onto each other and, right. and like you kind of start to question his innocence because he's being almost like performatively innocent and harmless in his willingness right. to be open as to the outcome of this thing, right. which right. she sees as a manipulation and as like right. gaslighting her about all of this. So it's like, it's it's just this like thing that seems so contrived and blown out of proportion but then there is this feeling of tension and climax of being like well does he snore or not like we we right. have to get to the bottom of this <laughs> you're just aching for it like when they when they okay so they do the sleep study and it's uh it's a very drawn out kind of thing and they go in for the final uh reveal an evaluation has been made they've they've wa- they've viewed all the videotape they've they have an, an idea of what is what is what it's coming to, what it, what is going on in their in their sleep uh, patterns and things like that. And things go completely off the rails crazy in a way that you don't expect. There's even more uh, literary devices being used as far as to put you off off point, you know, in the in the middle of a, a line. 
open myself's respective PPO and DMC patient codes and the dates of the relevant Wednesday nights during the actual film sleep experiments have been held or conducted, and this youth and the only heard a tiny. Salmonologists conferred together over a brush teeth or alum aluminum medical chart holder, respectively, <laughs> re precisely which tape to load and or cue in order to empirically verify the salmonologist's diagnosis of Hope's accusations, ultimately unreal. And it's like this little parentheses with only heard a tiny in italics. It's like, wait, wait, who said that? What is that? And then there's dreaming in later on. And there's please, capital P with an exclamation point. And you're just like, wait, 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 you know, and then you're feverishly reading. This is like the last three or four pages. And then there's, or hurt if you, if, and you just, you're just like, what is, what is happening now? And I think, I think we're there. I mean, we can go ahead and say it if you, <laughs> if you're ready. Well, I, I wanted to do one more sentence of buildup, but we are we sure. are basically there at the reveal. But um, all of these things are incongruously happening, like you mentioned in the parentheses. And if it if it isn't clear if you're listening, um, you don't know what these things are referring to, and you are right. missing something. It's not like right. oh, a closer reading would reveal what those mm -hmm. things are referring to. It's like th this is incongruous information. And there are construction sounds going on and ringing phones that may or may not be diegetic to the scene that's going on. And all of that is because this is a dream. And yeah. in and the dream, guy and the guy is hallucinating anyways. There's brackets within parentheses within brackets. Mm -hmm. And you just never have a real sense of what is the reality. And at the end there is the a, a, a trope, you know a tropish kind of reveal that you would say, okay, no matter what, don't do that. Yeah. At the end of your short story. <laughs> yeah. See that that's the thing is that this is, it's, it sounds unsatisfying if you haven't actually read the story, because this, this is almost like the first thing they teach you in like a creative writing class. Like don't have them wake up at the end and it's all a dream because like, there's something about a story anyway that's a contrivance of information that is supposed to take you into like a different world. And so to reveal it at the end as a dream is to kind of be redundant of like, yeah, a story already does that. So like it, it makes it also seem less important. Like, well, why did we read all of that then if it's revealed right. to be a dream? But it's successfully right. done here for for so many different reasons and seems to be like an intentional subversion of that rule it is but. it is it is masterfully done and and it's right in the middle of a sentence what it is is that we finally are getting some confirmation that randall in fact does snore that's right that's right <laughs> there, there is there is confirmation that he is actually snoring on the video that they're watching and in the middle of the the word is expression but it only gets out the x so the soft spreading cheeks now begin to distend in a grinningly familiar and sensual or even predatory facial x <laughs> and then instead of expression we get up wake up for the love of god my god i was having wake up the worst dream, I'd certainly say you were. And in this little section here, it is revealed that it's a dream. And not only is it a dream, but it's Hope's dream. That's right. So um, with that kind of, with when, when that, it, it strikes you so off that it's hard to apply that to what we've all just read. This, 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 once you have that bit of information, then going through this is a completely different story. Well, and, and I think that we had mentioned on the phone, and, and don't let me put words in your mouth, but the first time I read this, 
even though I realized it was Hope's dream, I did not realize what that meant for the story yet. I just thought right. it meant, oh, it's a dream. So like we thought it was Randall's perspective, it's right. her perspective, and it, which is still cool. There, that's still like a lot, that's a big move at the end, but that's like just the beginning of this because yeah. the, the sort of operative word in that incomplete sentence before it's revealed in the dream, in my opinion, is the predatory smile that appeared on his face. Familiar and sensual or even predatory facial expression. Yeah. That's what, that's the final uh, of the dream talk that we get. And when it comes down to it, um, it's not, it's not to serve just putting Hope's perspective on an idea of, well, then Randall, this is what she thinks of Randall. This is what she thinks Randall thinks or what she thinks Randall uh, feels. That's how I applied it at first. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, it's it was impossible to take it that deeper uh, level until, uh, except for rereading it with this in, in knowledge. But there is, and, and it's not just a descent into madness and not just scary in the way that it is, um, you know, a person not being able to make an argument, make a claim, be heard. They're going through sleep deprivation. They're become, descending into a madness like that. That kind of fear is not the fear. There is a deep sense of fear in this that is a sexual predator kind of fear. And that is not apparent on the first reading. There is, there is times when certain things are said, but they are said then dismissed or it is said in the way that those those final words are that it, it is an adjective to describe a, a smile that may be predatory or something but to use that word you know J david foster wallace doesn't use a word without meaning exactly what that word means right right <laughs> well and then and then giving it to you in in that way that it is like it's predatory in that it's a smile. So there's some sort of pleasure being derived here. And up until that point, his, his sort of odd sexual interests in younger women are treated as kind of like a trifle that it's like, it's a little creepy, but he's like, Oh, kind of a guys will, or like guys will be guys sort of thing. You mean Randall? Yeah. That like well, see, that it's, it's treated. I, I took it as like an accusation that didn't have any founding that like hope is putting this accusation out there. Like, you know, I seen the way you look at, you look at her sometimes or something like Audrey there, the, his, his not blood daughter and, and him being like, this is ridiculous. You know, I don't, you know, and dismissing it mm -hmm. and rightfully so, you know, if, if there's nothing there and, and that was how it was kind of handled, but it is, there is that fear of thoughts that randall has kind of about audrey and and in the dream now now we got to keep in mind always that this is hope's dream so there this is hope's uh whole thing that in the dream or in that randall has an, a hallucination where it is audrey's breasts are going up and down in her in her uh sweater like pistons is what it's called and this is a hallucination that he kind of is hallucinating that and he knows he's hallucinating that that's why it was called out like that but then he has a hallucination of uh audrey being supine on a canoe and him straining piston like above which is when you when you read it again in that way it is completely horrifying yeah and 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 there's this fear and and you know anger and rage uh Ray, randall is going through anger and rage he talks of it from his point of view in the in in the when he's having these arguments with hope that he can't convince her that he is willing to concede that he might be snoring or something like this and that he went to the ear nose and throat doctor to 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 do something about it and she just dismisses it you know and is saying 
well, you know that this is the thing. That's why you didn't tell me, whatever, that there's a rage that comes up in him. There's anger and there's a lot of rage and anger in this as well. And this, this is dream stuff. The fear, the rage, the anger, these kind of things, those are the reality, but they don't apply to a snoring problem between a married couple. See, exactly. Like it, it ends up becoming symbolic or like metaphorical and, and it's, it's a fitting, fitting image too, because snoring is something that is like done spontaneously <laughs> and involuntarily such as like a latent predatory desire or something like that. And so what made me think that it was treated more like a trifle at first is because it said from Randall's perspective in the framing of the dream that hope would at least have respect for him if he had the willingness to just ogle as opposed to compose himself and like act like a robot around Audrey and her friends um, because he knew it was inappropriate in some way. And so like, this is basically her projection of him repressing this predatory desire within himself. And so I think a way to look at it is that when she's apparently in the dream, waking up in the middle of the night to accuse him of this thing that he vehemently denies She's kind of accusing him of having this latent desire to be predatory with this daughter, who we also haven't mentioned so far, may or may not even exist. Right. right? Because right. In, the, in the dream, or when she wakes up from the dream and wants right. to believe this is base reality again, right. um, Randall or whomever she is talking to in bed asks, like, who is Audrey? Or does she ask who's right. Audrey? Well, so, he, goes, he goes, wait, am I even? No, she, Hope goes, wait, am I even married? And the person that's talking to Hope we don't know who that person is. It, it's, it might not, there, there might not be a Randall. This is, this is all Audrey or Hope's dream stuff. So she goes, wait, am I even married? The, the, the person responds, please don't start all this again. And she says, and who is this Audrey? That's right. That's right. And he goes, go, just go back to sleep now. And what's that, daddy? Just lie back down. What's wrong with your mouth? You are my wife. None of this is real. It's all all right. End. So, I mean, it might be something where, you know, there a lot of Randall and, and the, the anger and the not being able to prove something, not being able to be open and, and say it and, and, and make an accusation that is going to be heard or deny something and, and that it be, um, have any power. His powerlessness is hopes. Randall is like a projection of hope, but also hope is a projection of hope in a way. And also Audrey is a projection of hope. And I think that that is even the most pointed it may be the most pointed there that audrey in the dreams is hope and randall is dr sype her stepfather and the waking at the end may be a child hope not even an adult but a young hope that is actually saying guys why say Dad, what is what's that, Daddy? What is that, yeah. Daddy? You know, and it's just like, Ehh! yeah. David Foster Wallace is 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 has has totally used um something very mundane to illustrate something completely horrific in the way of inner mind states and what uh and coping mechanisms in the face of abuse. And, and it seems like, yeah, that like per projection is at the core of all of this, because I, I think you're right on the money specifically with the Audrey thing that Audrey is a stand in for hope herself projected within the dream. And we even get these different doubling names throughout the story. So like right. the name Audrey could have come from this real Audrey in real hope's life. And then like right. her sister Vivian has a doubled name with this Jack Vivian that right. comes in. And exactly. so 
yeah, her friend Vivian that she confides in. Or no, it's, her, it's her Jeff. sister, right? Isn't it? It's, it's her sister, right, right, yeah. right. Uh, or st- sister or stepsister, who knows if it's a full-blooded sister at this point. But but, but with, uh, then Jack uh, Vivian. But within all of this, it's it seems that like that so much of this, in addition to this fear of abuse, is like if we do take the interpretation that she is with a spouse or a lover or something like that, is the recapitulation of the past, which is something that we were seeing explored through Randall's perspective throughout that he is in his second marriage. She's in her second marriage. All of these different characters are on their like second or third try at trying to make a family work. And then this fear that she has doesn't only come from her own trauma at being abused, but also at this distrust of men, of having to like project that onto them of like, well, is he going to desire a daughter in the same way that my stepfather desired me when I was a daughter, you know? So it's like- and, and all of that, again, is just treated in this way that it's like, it's just about snoring. It's just a right. silly marital conflict, it's, but it, it, it's everything crazy. is in but there. But see, the snoring, and, and I, I wrote this, I want to touch on one thing, another yep. analog that I saw that is the doctor and the tech that are in the sleep study are an analog oh, for the stepdad and for Hope as well. The doctor is an older man, is described very uh, detailed. And then the tech is this young and forbiddingly nubile female. That's how she's described. So these kind of things on a second reread or a third, just, 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 just shout at you mm-hmm. that once you know this is dream stuff and this is a dream projection, there's a lot going on underneath the surface. Um, and But the surface level, the snoring and all that calls out to, I think, what is the main main theme? This um, is a bla- is about oblivion, oblivion in the face of something traumatic that you can't don't don't want to face. So, the oblivion of sleep, snoring is a product of sleep, and hope is sleeping, and whether she's an adult, and this is a horrible memories that surface in the dream times and this kind of stuff and and become what we're reading or it is actually trying to fall into sleep and to create a construct of a life that is not like what she is in right now because it is so horrifying and 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 the wanting oblivion the oblivion of sleep to escape reality um i think is what this this story is all about on on multiple levels and um it it, it's great that i mean this is this story like no other shows oblivion the 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 idea of oblivion not knowing not being able to face um, like like no other story that's in the collection. Well, and that's that's what I think makes it such a masterpiece too. Is that, like we said, um, treated indelicately, revealing everything to be a dream, usually makes it seem like, well, what was the point of all of that? But what makes it so impactful here is that even after it's revealed that any of the details that we just saw might have been just these projections that have no basis in reality, or at least a very like like transferred right. basis in reality right. Right. it makes it more impactful it makes right. it more horrifying because right. we know that it's like this is her subconscious trying to, to deal, deal and, and right. hope and and it's it's too big right for for her or for us as a reader to understand it and it's right. only expression that it can take is into right. this really weird dream that that ends up just becoming like more than the sum of its parts, and uh, and and just th- these like horrifying elements that that end up coming toward the end of this dream, where like the doctors at the table rip their faces off, and right. these images are coming together, and it's described in this like totally incongruous way, which is like, which is what a nightmare feels like. That there there are not these smooth transitions, and people who shouldn't know each other are appearing in the same place, and right. and. At one point, one of the technicians mouths the word suicide to, to Randall, 
Right. And that was a moment. Right. I remember reading that the first time in college and just chills just because right. it, it's so it's so harmless, but it's just right. haunting. These details. Yeah. And it's like, you know, at fir first reading, you're like, well, he's 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 really at the end of his rope. Huh. And then the second or, or third, when you know this is a dream and that it's Aubrey's projection right here, that like her reality is so horrifying that she's contemplating suicide. Yeah, you know this kind of thing comes into play. So <clears throat> it's hardcore. David Foster Wallace doesn't pull any pump punches. <laughs> he does not. It's like, yeah, it. I mean, it. It is just everything. It. It deserves the uh, the uh, titular position in this collection, and it's something that like I fully anticipate an even more complex read the next time that I go through this because. Right. Every little detail from the, the most mundane ringing phone in the background in the club at the beginning right. just just ends up like building toward this thing that is just so beautiful and so scary. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's it's a uh, terrifying hor horrific. And um, there is there is this kind of to David Foster Wallace, just an underlying uh, some kind of crazy beauty of how he can actually like you know how did he do this you know how do you do this I don't know. It's, it's 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 wild so um uh, one thing one more thing i'll say about a dream being a cop out it'll be something that you know is something that would put somebody off you know but i'm reminded just because you brought him up at the beginning of the talk too of another uh series it's a it's a it's a a series not a not a book that people love that there there's the there's the big reveal as well and it's david lynch's twin peaks well that's right so i i have to confess i have not finished twin peaks okay yeah <laughs> yeah david lynch uh david lynch obviously loved david foster wallace and and vice versa right <laughs> I mean, I, I I wasn't aware of David Lynch liked David Foster Wallace, but I mean, yeah, I'm familiar with the like, and and it makes sense when you think of it because I I think unfortunately David Foster Wallace gets a reputation sometimes as just being this like really heady academic writer, and there there isn't always like the surreal reputation that I think he should have, and that like dream quality oh, yeah. that David Lynch is so good at. So oh yeah, and I mean with this with this story, it, it's on display. Uh, maybe, maybe m more than any other that the surreal uh, feeling. And I had said that this is David Foster Wallace uh, doing Twilight Zone, mm -hmm. you know, because it feels like that. You're just like, where am I and what is happening? And you can't wait to kind of get the get the crux of it. And then when you get the crux of it, you kind of wish you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's it's bad it's it's wild uh, all right so uh i i got nothing else man i i think i think that's anything further i could say would just just beat a dead horse i think we got it <laughs> well thank you very much for having me on daniel this was really really fun absolutely it was great talking to you noah so yeah this has been uh, off the wall novels in collaboration with everyone who reads it must converse so uh yeah Thanks for stopping by. You got it. Have a good night, buddy. You too. See ya.